Hello guys, let's begin with the new chapter, Why do we fall ill? A basic introduction will be given initially in this chapter, followed by the topic, Health and its Failure, which includes the subtopics, Significance of Health, Personal and Community Issues, Both Matter of Our Health, and Distinction Between Healthy and Disease-Free. This will be followed by the topic, Disease and its Causes which includes the subtopics what does disease look like acute and chronic diseases we will try to define what are acute diseases and what are chronic diseases then we will learn chronic disease and poor health causes of diseases and in the end the subtopic will be infectious and non-infectious causes of disease the last topic of this chapter is infectious diseases which includes the agents which causes these diseases the means by which these diseases spread, organ-specific and tissue-specific manifestation, principles of treatment, and in the end, we will end the chapter with principles of prevention. So let's begin the chapter. To give a brief overview, cells are made up of a variety of chemical substances such as proteins, carbohydrates, fats or lipids, and so on. Although the picture looks quite static, in reality the living cell is a dynamic place. Many processes goes on and there is nothing static. Something or the other always happen. Cells move from place to place. Even in cells that do not move, there is repair going on. New cells are being made. In our organs or tissues, there are various specialized activities going on. For example, the heart is beating. The lungs are breathing, the kidney is filtering urine, the brain is thinking, etc. All these activities are interconnected. Now suppose one of the activities starts to malfunction. For example, if the kidneys are not filtering urine, the poisonous substances will accumulate inside the body. Under such conditions, the brain will not be able to think properly. For all these interconnected activities, therefore, energy and raw material are needed from outside the body. In other words, food is necessary for cell and tissue functions. So anything that prevents proper functioning of cell and tissues will lead to lack of proper activity of the body. So what is the significance of the word health? We have heard the word health which is used quite frequently all around us in general language. We use it ourselves as well when we say things like, my grandmother's health is not good. Our teachers use it when they scold us saying, this is not a healthy attitude. So what does the word health mean? If we think about it, we, re we realize that it always implies the idea of being well. We can think of this well-being as effective functioning of the body. For our grandmothers, being able to go out to market or visit neighbors is being well, and not being able to do such things is a poor health. Being interested in following the teaching in classrooms so that we can understand the world is called a healthy attitude, while not being interested in is called the opposite. Health is therefore is a state of well-being enough to function well physically, mentally, and socially. Personal and community issues both matter for health. If health means a state of physical, mental, and social well-being, it cannot be something that each one of us can achieve entirely on our own. The health of all organisms will depend on their surroundings and their environment. The environment includes the physical environment. But in particular, if we talk about human beings, we live in societies. Our social environment, therefore, is an important factor in our individual health. We live in villages, towns, or cities. In such places, even our physical environment is decided by our social environment. Consider an example. What would happen if no agency is ensuring that garbage is collected and disposed? What would happen if no one takes responsibility for clearing trains and ensuring that water does not collect in the streets or open spaces? In such a scenario, if there is a great deal of garbage thrown in our street or if there is an open drain water lying stagnant around somewhere we live, the possibility of poor health increases. 
because such places becomes breeding uh, points for many diseases. Therefore, public cleanliness is an important factor for individual health. We need food for health and this food will have to be earned by doing some work. For this, the opportunity to do work has to be available. So also good economic conditions and jobs are therefore needed for individual health. We need to be happy in order to be truly healthy. Why so? Because if we mistreat each other and are afraid of each other, we cannot be happy and healthy and hence we cannot work properly. Social equality and harmony are therefore necessary for individual health. We can think of many other such examples for connections between community issues and individual health. Moving forward, now let's see distinctions between healthy and disease-free. These words are actually self-explanatory. We can think of it as disease which means distributed ease. Disease in other words literally means being uncomfortable. However, the word is used in more limited meaning. We can talk of disease when we can find a specific and particular cause for discomfort. This does not mean that we have to know the absolute final cause of that. We can say that someone is suffering from diarrhea without knowing exactly what has caused the loose motions. We can now easily see that it is possible to be in poor health without actually suffering from a particular disease. Simply not being diseased is not the same as being healthy. Good health for a dancer may mean being able to stretch his body into difficult but graceful positions. On the other hand, good health for a musician may mean having enough breathing capacity in his or her lungs to control the notes from his or her flute. To have the opportunity to realize the unique potential in all of us is also necessary for real health. So, we can be in poor health without there being a simple cause of any of the identifiable disease. This is the reason why when we think about health, we think about societies and communities. On the other hand, when we think about disease, we think about individual sufferers. So what does disease look like? There are many tissues in the body. These tissues make up physiological systems or organ systems that carry out body functions. For example, the heart pumps blood throughout the body and the lungs help in dissolving the oxygen that is present in air into the blood. Each of the organ system has a specific organ as its part and has particular functions. So the digestive system has stomach and intestines and it helps to digest food taken from um, outside the body. The musculoskeletal system, which is made up of bones and muscles, hold the body parts together and help the body move. When there is a disease, either the functioning or the appearance of one or more systems of the body will change for the worse. These changes give rise to symptoms or signs of disease. Symptoms of disease are the things we feel as being wrong. So, we have a headache, we have a cough, we have those motions, we have wound with pus, these are all symptoms. These indicate that there may be a disease, but they don't indicate what the disease is. For example, a headache may mean just examination stress, or very rarely it may mean meningitis, or any one of the dozen different diseases. Signs of disease are what physicians will look for on the basis of the symptoms. Signs will give a little more definite indication of the presence of particular disease. Physicians will also get laboratory tests done to pinpoint the disease further. For example, when we are suffering from some disease, we go to the hospital to get a blood test or a urine test done to find the disease. Now let's see what are acute and chronic diseases. Some diseases last for only few days, that is very short period of time, and these are called acute diseases. Common cold lasts for just few days and hence comes under acute diseases. Some diseases can last for long time, even as much as a lifetime, and hence are called chronic diseases. An example is the infection causing elephantiasis, which is very common in some parts of India. 
Now let's see in detail what are chronic diseases and how is it related to poor health. Acute and chronic diseases have different effects on our health. Any disease that causes poor functioning of some part of body will affect our general health as well. This is because all functions of the body are necessary for general health. But an acute disease which is over very soon will not have time to cause major effects on our general health while a chronic disease will do so. We may not go to school for a few days if we have an acute disease. But a chronic disease will make it difficult for us to follow what is being taught in school and reduce our ability to learn. In other words, we are likely to have prolonged general poor health if we have a chronic disease. Chronic diseases therefore have very drastic long-term effects on people's health as compared to acute diseases. So what are the causes of these diseases? Having learned about acute and chronic diseases, this is the next question that we need to answer. When we think about causes of diseases, we must remember that there are many levels of such causes. Let us look at an example and explain this. If there is a baby suffering from loose motions, we can say that the cause of loose motions is an infection with a virus. So the immediate cause of the disease is a virus. But the next question is, where did the virus come from? Suppose we find that the virus came through unclean drinking water. But many babies must have had this unclean drinking water. So why is it that one baby developed loose motions when the other babies did not? One reason might be that this baby is not healthy. As a result, it might be more likely to have disease when exposed to risk whereas healthier babies would not. Why is the baby not healthy? Perhaps because it is not well nourished and does not get enough food. So lack of good nourishment becomes a second level cause of the disease the baby is suffering from. Further, why is the baby not well nourished? Perhaps because it is from a household which is poor. It is also possible that baby has some genetic difference that makes it more likely to suffer from loose motions when expo exposed to such virus. Without the virus, the genetic difference or the poor nourishment alone would not lead to loose motions. But they do become contributory causes of the disease. So why was there no clean drinking water for the baby? Perhaps because the public services are poor where the baby's family lives. So poverty or lack of public services become the third level cause of the baby's disease. It will now be obvious that all diseases will have immediate causes and contributory causes. Also, most diseases will have many causes rather than one single cause. With this, we come to the end of the first part of this chapter. This chapter is quite a theoretical one, so I would suggest that go through these video lectures one and try to relate the situations with your day-to-day -day life and it will be easier for you to understand these concepts. With this, I end this first part of the chapter. Thank you.